Uh, so let's start. We have today two papers uh, on globalization. Uh, I understand that the titles of the two papers have been slightly changed with respect to uh, what is written here in, in the program. Uh, the first paper, Italy and the First Stage of Globalization, 1861-1940, by Harold James and Kevin O'Rourke, uh, will be discussed by Stefano Fenoaltea and, uh, and Vera Zamagni. Uh, there's one hour uh, for, uh, for, this, uh, for, for the presentation and the discussion, so I would say 25 minutes for the presentation, uh, 15 minutes each for the discussions, and the five uh, final minutes for the authors to uh, um, reply uh, to the two discussions, uh, and uh, the same for the second paper, and then we're going to have a, a general discussion regarding both papers uh, after, and before the summing up by Fabrizio Sacrament. So let's start with the first paper, the first globalization uh, Italy and the first stage of globalization, and uh, who will be the first? Uh, Kevin O'Rourke. Okay, please. Um, thank you very much to the organizers for uh, inviting us here today. Like Tony, I feel the need to stand up to keep myself awake, uh, whatever about you people. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and I promise not to keep you too long so we can all make our escape in good time. Uh, what we want to do today is to talk about Italy in a slightly comparative way. We want to try to suggest that a lot of Italian policies that were adopted during our period were not all that strange or unusual in the context uh, of the time. And that, therefore, if you want to blame uh, Italian failures during this period on the bad policy mistakes of Italy's uh, politicians or alternatively to praise its politicians for the prudent decisions that they made which can explain Italian success because one of the things that we learned at the pre-conference is that one of the biggest debates that divides you all is whether Italy is a story of success or a story of failure and we're not going to get into that but whatever way uh, you want to argue it we're going to argue that the policies that surely mattered one way or another weren't all that strange or unusual. And this is part of a broader intellectual agenda that I think we share, which is a, a commitment to comparative economic history. Uh, so economic historians are caught between the desire of the economist to generalize and the desire of the historian to come up with particularistic explanations for particular uh, episodes in history. And a comparative perspective is, is doubly useful. It helps you see what is common in a country's experience, and it also helps you more clearly distinguish what is truly distinctive about that country's uh, experience. What Italy in 1861 faced was a series of challenges that were common to many, many countries uh, at that time. And in the paper we uh, talk about the way in which Germany served as one role model uh, for Italian statesmen. That's not a surprise. Both of these countries were unified at around the same time. Uh, the unification processes were uh, led by states, uh, Prussia on the one case and Piedmont, and before that Savoy, Piedmont on the other, that were rather odd states. They were odd geographically. Uh, they were states that contained within them what we might today regard as a rich diversity. They were full of all sorts of different kinds of people. But it isn't clear that the leaders of the day would have viewed this rich diversity as being a particular uh, advantage. And so we, we speculate that perhaps there were similar impulses propelling the unification uh, urges in both cases. Whatever about that, uh, the form that the unification took was rather similar. It occurred in a context of warfare. Uh, and once the unifications had been achieved, that fundamentally disrupted the geopolitical equilibrium within Europe. As we now know, it made Europe a much less stable and a much more dangerous place. And it was a place where uh, being militarily competitive was extremely important. It was a question of national uh, survival. And so one of the challenges that these new states faced was how to become and remain militarily uh, competitive. We can, we can certainly regret that. As Europeans, we can certainly regret it, given that we know how the story ends. But it's not 
that unusual for an Italian to worry about uh, how to make uh, his country militarily competitive. That then had implications for industrial policy because warfare is becoming industrial at this time, as we saw in America in the early 1860s. And so if you're going to worry about uh, military competitiveness, you're going to worry about building up a military industrial complex. And because this is uh, an industrial sector that is extremely capital intensive, and Italy is a capital scarce country, this isn't something that's just going to happen automatically uh, or by itself. And that leads then to uh, a second set of challenges, which is the desire to become industrial. Uh, Gershon Crown had a lot to say about this, and, and we can talk about this a little bit. And then the third challenge, which is interrelated, is how to deal with globalization. Uh, so the late 19th century is a period of tremendous globalization. On the one hand, it offers opportunities if you're a wine grower or a silk manufacturer. On the other hand, if you're a wheat uh, grower, this is going to pose a challenge to you, and it's going to pose a challenge pretty systematically to any country on the periphery that seeks to industrialize. Uh, and these are a set of challenges that are not at all peculiar uh, to Italy. Insofar as we find uh, specificity to the Italian experience, we believe that the greatest specificity is to be found in the area of industrial policy. And we'll try to argue later on that actually, uh, in responding to the challenges of the time, uh, Italian policymakers in industrial policy, they made some choices that were extremely unorthodox. They weren't necessarily dreadful. Now, a filo rosso that is running through this paper of ours is the theme of Italian capital scarcity, which is another way of saying that Italy was a poor and relatively backward country in 1861. And this has all sorts of implications for all sorts of policy areas. We're going to be talking about trade policy. We're going to be talking about monetary and banking policy. We're going to be talking about industrial policy. And the fact that Italy is a capital scarce economy uh, is crucial to understanding the decisions that Italy made along all of these dimensions. Uh, so if you think about what were the sectors that Italy were protecting, well, they were, it was largely manufacturing. It was, it was wheat as well. We'll talk about that. But within manufacturing, it was largely heavy industry, which was a particularly capital-intensive industry. And that makes sense. If you wanted these things and you were Italy, you probably were going to have to uh, resort to protectionism. Uh, a filo d'oro, if I can bow to Giovanni, wherever he is, uh, running through this, is the uh, frequent attempts by Italy to gain access to international capital markets on favorable terms, and particular attempts by the Italian state to gain access to international capital markets on favorable terms. And the way to do this was to join the gold standard in our period. And uh, they often succeeded, as you'll see, in gaining access to capital on favorable international terms through this mechanism. But sometimes they succeeded only too well. Sometimes it wasn't only the government which succeeded in borrowing abroad. It was the private sector as well. And regrettably, when the private sector goes and borrows, it isn't just capital K that comes in in a fungible way and does things to your capital stock. is channeled through bank balance sheets. And this can cause problems, as we know. Uh, so you get a wave of capital inflows, you get banking crises occurring from time to time, and then you get institutional reforms. And one of the interesting questions to ask is, were these crises salutary in the sense that they produced uh, reforms that ended up being uh, beneficial? And finally, as I've mentioned before, if you want to understand where the uh, steelworks attorney come from, they partly come from the fact that uh, Italy is a capital-scarce country trying to become uh, militarily competitive at a very dangerous time in European history. So turning to um, trade policy, the story starts before the beginning. It starts in the 1850s, as you know, with the switch of Piedmont, Piedmont Savoy, as it was then, I insist, uh, to a more or less free trading policy. And this free trade policy is more or less imposed on the entire peninsula subsequent on unification. That in itself isn't at all unusual, because this is a liberal time uh, in terms of trade policy in Europe in general. Uh, maybe what is unusual, certainly in the context of the 20th century experience, is that this new free trade area is uh, imposed just like that. There's no uh, transition period uh, that would allow southern manufacturers to adjust or anything like that. It's, it's free trade uh, in a very short period of time indeed. There's then a reaction. Manufacturers don't like this. That's not surprising. Italy is a capital-scarce country. Uh, there's an initial move to protection in 1878. That's not unusual. Bismarck is doing the same thing at precisely the same time. The French are doing the same thing at around precisely the same time. By 1887, this protection is now becoming heavily oriented towards uh, heavy industry. In terms of the political economy of all of this, we speculate this isn't all that unusual. 
either. Uh, if you're a grain grower at this time in Europe, you are probably protectionist because you're facing competition uh, from uh, the prairies of the New World, from the Ukraine, and so on. So a lot of landowners are going to switch into the protectionist camp at this stage, and wheat growing and sugar growing uh, receive very, very high levels of protection at this time. But as Ronald Rogowski points out, you're also going to get in relatively poor countries in Europe, capitalists joining the protectionist cause uh, for the reasons I've mentioned, capitalist scarce and you want to build up your sector uh, and so on. I, I also should mention that he then goes on to speculate that in countries where you have both capitalists and landlords on the same side of the trade debate, which is a very salient debate in the context of 19th century Europe, you're going to get a type of politics that isn't terribly liberal. You're going to have the rich guys, all of the rich guys, the landowners and the capitalists on one side, the workers who are free traders on the other side. This is not like in Britain, where the capitalists are free traders and are on the same side as the workers, or Belgium would be another case in point. I won't go down that road. There's a huge debate within the Italian economic history profession about whether this protection was good or bad for Italy. There are some people who argue that without tariffs you wouldn't have had uh, the sorts of industries that you did at all. There are some people who argue that grain tariffs maybe helped smooth the adjustment that was inevitable following the grain invasion. There are other people who follow uh, Gershenkron uh, in saying that the structure of protection was fundamentally unhealthy, that this uh, emphasis on protecting heavy industry made life difficult for the engineering sector, that they could have given a bigger boost to chemicals, which was a more promising sector, and all of that. We don't even dare to wade into this debate. There are people in this room and at this table who know a lot more about this than we do. What we can do is provide a little bit of comparative perspective and think about uh, whether these levels of Italian protection, whether they were good or bad, were out of the ordinary or not. So, uh, this is where you get into these questions of how you measure the level of protection, and that's easier said than done, as Peter Neary and Jim Anderson have told us. Um, so if you go to, where are my, it's 8 to 10 percent there, it's that one there, isn't it? I'll try not to blind you, Harold. So there's Italy, 8 to 10 percent, not out of the ordinary uh, at that period, and not out of the ordinary actually in 1913 either. There are a lot of countries that are not on this table, of course. The United States is not on this table. It certainly had protect tariffs that were way higher than anything that was happening in Italy at the time. Spain is not on this table, I don't think, is it? Okay, and hopefully they have big, higher tariffs. They do have higher tariffs. And are the Norwegians and the Swedes there as well? You can see they have quite high tariffs as well sometimes. Italy's not that out of the ordinary. Now, there's one problem with focusing on 1913, as a lot of authors have done, and that is that there's a phase in which Italian tariffs gradually rise up to a peak maybe in the early 1890s, and then Italian trade negotiators go out and they negotiate a series of treaties where they say to Germany, for example, uh, we will lower our grain tariff uh, in return for greater uh, access for your manufacturing exports. So they do this, this kind of deal with a bunch of uh, countries. And so uh, 18, 1913 is at the end of that phase. So there was an earlier period where actually Italy was more protectionist than these dates would suggest. Um, so, uh, with Sabila Lehmann, I've put together data on average manufacturing uh, tariffs. So this is just comparing Italy with the sorts of countries that she would have wanted to be compared with herself at the time, with the other great powers. Uh, and what you can see is that it, uh, compared to France or Germany, or certainly the United Kingdom, Italy's tariffs are, especially in the, in the early, slightly earlier periods, they're quite high by, by these standards. They end up then uh, declining. But I should emphasize that on this uh, graph, I don't have America, I don't have uh, Spain, I don't have uh, Sweden, I don't have various other countries that would have had uh, higher tariffs. Uh, and what about uh, agriculture? So the sector that benefited the most from protection was probably uh, wheat, wheat and sugar growing. Uh, so we have a uh, chart on the table that shows that in Italy as elsewhere, nominal wheat prices through this period were actually falling. So this is maybe partly because of a general deflation. It's probably also because of supply side developments on the prairies, uh, reapers, and, and declining transport costs, and all of this stuff. So all of that protection wasn't sufficient to stop the price of wheat from falling. But of course, that doesn't mean that without the protection, the price of wheat uh, wouldn't have been higher than it ended up being. What you see in the data is that these wheat prices are all co-moving very clearly across different uh, European countries. What I have here is the price of wheat in each of these markets relative to the price of wheat in Odessa uh, on the Black Sea, which is where the Russian 
wheat would have come from. And again, you know, the, the story is somewhat similar. The Brits are, are, are the free traders, and they have the lowest uh, prices of grain by the end of the period relative to, to Odessa. Uh, Italy is in there. It's, it's part of the pack. It's, it's relatively high compared to these other two big continental countries, but it's not off the scale high, and it isn't always uh, got the highest wheat prices. And again, if I were to look at other countries uh, in Europe, Italy would look even less extraordinary uh, than it does in these figures. So I guess what I want to conclude with on trade policy is that the, the ebbs and flows of Italian trade policy mirror the ebbs and flows of trade policy in Europe more generally. If you look at the uh, levels of protection, they're not out of the ordinary either. And that continues on into the 1920s. Uh, that, of course, that's when everything changes radically, and that's what Harold will talk about, along with other things. Sure, shall I remain here? Um, do, do you want to I, use need to, I need to use that. Thing. You do, yeah. um, so, uh, the story of how you're connected with the global economy is often simplified to the question of how are you connected to the international monetary order. And that was a particularly big issue in the decade after the Kingdom of Italy uh, was established because this was the period in which it actually looked for a moment as if the world might even be headed toward a single, not just a single European currency, but even a single global currency. In 1867, uh, Napoleon III uh, convened a an International Monetary Congress in Paris to discuss exactly that goal of global monetary unification and it would rest on a common standard between the franc or the lira um, and the US dollar after the end of the Civil War uh, and the British pound. It never, never obviously got realized, uh, but it was an indication of the way in which many people thought in the 1860s the world was going. There were also similar discussions of the unification of postal standards, of weights and measures. Uh, the International Red Cross is a creation of the 1860s as well. So everything was being globalized in the 1860s. And Italy uh, was part of that uh, at the beginning um, uh, and looked as if it was moving through the Latin Monetary Union into this story of a single world currency or at least the adoption of a gold standard. But then that story got interrupted uh, by the War of 1866 um, and the convertibility was suspended as a result of the, the war. Um, and Italy only returns uh, in the 1880s. Um, we discuss in the paper, and it's the theme that Kevin uh, already brought up very clearly, um, the principal reason for doing this, what was the hope, what was the aspiration of Italy or of other countries indeed in going on to the gold standard, um, the chief hope is that it will give access for capital scarce countries to borrowing at better rates. Uh, so the gold standard is uh, some people call it the good housekeeping seal of approval, but it's the kind of admission test, really, for the access uh, to the international capital markets. And um, that's indeed exactly what happens uh, in the aftermath of 1883. Uh, there's a big inflow of capital, um, uh, a big boom. It's channeled uh, through, the, through the banking system, uh, through the, the, the big banks of the time, uh, the, the Credito Mobiliare and the Banca Generale. Um, and I think this is an interesting area in which general economic history and banking history should come uh, more together because one of the stories when there are these big capital inflows is that they have to go through particular institutions. They're channeled uh, through through a particular institutional set of arrangements. And the capital inflows allowed this big expansion of bank lending, uh, but also in the end created with a big speculative uh, boom in the 1880s, a set of dangers that in the end 
blew up that banking system and those big banks of the 1880s uh, failed in the 1890s and that created the circumstances in which there was then a new, really uh, absolutely new need to revise the banking system uh, to create new banks, to create the Banca d'Italia in place of the previous bank of issues. So the whole monetary arrangements of Italy uh, w were transformed as a result of that, first of all, that big surge of inflows and then uh, the, the crisis. Um, and then we look um, to how stable that new outcome of the 1890s was. It seems to us that it really proved its worth and the general financial and economic crisis that hit the world in 1907 um, had Italy in a much more resilient position uh, than it was in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, you can see also, I think, uh, part of the effect of this uh, access to the gold standard in, in this chart, the, uh, how much more expensive was it uh, for Italy, and in this case for the Italian government uh, to borrow, than it was for the French government to borrow. Um, you can see as you move into the 1890s and the 1900s that that gap begins to narrow although it's always cheaper uh, before the First World War for France to borrow than it was for Italy to borrow. And that's a contrast, say, uh, with your northern neighbor, uh, with Switzerland, where there's the similar premium. It's more expensive to borrow in Switzerland um, until the creation of the Swiss National Bank, a kind of equivalent uh, monetary reform to that of the early 1890s. Um, but with that, uh, Switzerland begins to borrow at the same price as France uh, after 1907. And so uh, for Switzerland, that really disappears, that, uh, that premium uh, that you need to pay uh, relative uh, to the French market. Um, that story really gets repeated in the 1920s, and the motivation is surprisingly similar. Um, the story of Italy's return back to the gold standard with the Quota Novanta is, is, is often told. Um, it's often told as a story of a policy mistake, uh, but the idea is fundamentally the same one as in the 1880s, uh, that if you go back to, to gold, uh, that you will be able to borrow, that the Italian government will be able to borrow uh, more cheaply, um, and that Italian private sector will also be able to borrow more cheaply. Um, that's a kind of rationale that works until the uh, Great Depression, but with the Great Depression it stops working because the, the capital markets uh, fail. Um, again, you can see uh, in the comparison with France that sometimes in the 1920s there are moments at which, uh, because of this policy, uh, Italy is even borrowing more cheaply uh, than France could borrow. Now, um, a further aspect of this uh, story of trying to overcome uh, capital scarcity is the Italian story of developmentalism. In the paper, we take one particular instance of this because it seems to be a really uh, nice instance, the uh, decision in the 1880s uh, to build up uh, the big steelworks in Terni, um, very much uh, modeled in the, in the uh, argumentation and the rationalization for it uh, on the German pattern of development. Uh, there are lots and lots of references when people think about why you should build in Terni, um, why Italy needs a big steel sector, um, to the reflection on the 1860s because in the 1860s it's often thought uh, that the reason that uh, Prussia won the, the Battle of Satterwell of Königgrätz in 1866 is to do with the industrial preeminence that was given in particular uh, by the big Essen steelworks of Krupp and so looking at Krupp becomes a theme uh, for Tani, and it's obviously uh, 
a, a nice historical coincidence that at the end of this whole story, Eterni ends up being owned by ThyssenKrupp. Um, uh, but there are other aspects of the strategy of developmentalism that uh, we see as being a, a threat, and we concentrate on one particular sector, on the steel sector, uh, uh, before the First World War, but then more in the First World War, um, the idea of developing what is Italy's, uh, uh, one of Italy's resource advantages as opposed to the disadvantages that faced Italy on the whole at the period of Tani because you don't have a, a good uh, coking coal basis. Um, but there is a big hydroelectric um, potential. And so you, using hydroelectricity uh, to produce steel becomes something that becomes viable before the First World War but then is really driven on further uh, during the First World War uh, through the Bonomi Decree um, and becomes a theme of developmental policy uh, in the 1920s and 1930s. The idea of that, uh, again, it's partly militarily uh, justified of having a complete steel-making capacity uh, rather than uh, uh, isolated uh, individual uh, works. Um, now, um, the most innovative aspect in the 1930s um, seemed to us the creation of Erie, and this is something that really doesn't have very many parallels in other countries. It's an Italian specificity, but it really follows from the logic that we tried to sp spell out earlier of attracting capital inflows that go then through the banking system and make banking vulnerable um, and then lead to a need to absorb the losses of the banking system through some reorganization. Uh, the reorganization in the 1890s was the one that produced the new Italian banks, the uh, Banca Commerciale and the Credito Italiano, uh, and the institutional, uh, the national central banking system uh, through the Banca d'Italia. Uh, the reorganization in the 1920s and 1930s takes place in two stages. First of all, banks are pushed in in the early 1920s in order to absorb the losses of big industrial companies as a result of the dramatic price fluctuations in the aftermath of the war, the inflation in the war and then the deflation of the post-war period. Um, the banks themselves um, are terribly hit in another episode of price instability in the early 1930s, uh, and the losses now need to be transferred to the state so that the state holding company that's created in 1933, uh, the uh, ERI, uh, is in the aftermath of the crisis uh, really running a large part of Italian industry. Um, uh, all of the uh, military metallurgical industry, 40% uh, of the non-military metallurgical in industry, but it, it puts the, uh, the, the uh, this new state holding company into the role of the driving force in the Italian economy. So um, the, the reaction that Italy has to the breakdown of globalization in the 1930s is in some ways uh, familiar in other countries, and this paper uh, takes, uh, we've already uh, underlined that, a comparative uh, emphasis in terms of trade policy, in terms of moving to bilateralism, in terms of developing links with colonies. Uh, this, is, this is standard uh, to almost every European country. Um, the imposition of exchange controls, so modifying the gold standard through exchange controls in increasingly severe regulations from 1931 onwards, is also part of the um, the standard policy apparatus of European states and the uh, sense in which Italy might not formally have abandoned the gold standard but took measures which limited the application of the gold standard through the application of extreme exchange controls uh, is uh, characteristic. So also uh, military Keynesianism, uh, 
the monetary financing of public sector deficits um, is, a, is a really common story. Um, but ERI uh, is really a unique element um, and we wondered about the extent to which it provided a point of departure for the post-war miracle, um, whether this capacity to allocate and to channel resources uh, and to have a basis for some sort of economic planning um, was, was not something that in the end was part of the explanation uh, of the post-war miracle. But if so, it comes with a note of caution uh, because it may be that the institutions uh, that are suitable <coughs> for doing this initial uh, spurt to growth um, become really dysfunctional and increasingly dysfunctional the further on you go in that period. So again, uh, you have a, a note of caution uh, on this. Um, we, we, we wanted also to think about the way in which this uh, whole story uh, will relate to a convergence story. Um, and we think that one of the features that we've been able to identify is that up to the 1890s, Italian incomes were still diverging from those in uh, northern industrial European countries, but from the 1900s, uh, we begin to see a convergence process, which is, I, I think, part of the, the uh, logic of, uh, of, of catch-up. Um, so to conclude, um, two big crises, um, 1893 and then the period of the Great Depression, they both produce institutional responses uh, that are in some ways uh, really quite adequate uh, to the situation and produce improvement. Um, uh, but the new institutions feed into a new set of problems. The universal banks that were created in the 1890s are problematical in the 1920s and Erie is really problematical from the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and it seems to us in this way that this is a story that has a general lesson uh, for the applicability to crises. I mean, Erie, for instance, is particularly interesting, I think, to study at the moment uh, because there's such a widespread discussion um, of what so-called bad banks can do, what you can do by stripping out the bad non-performing assets of the um, uh, banking sector uh, and put them, put them somewhere else. This is the case of a massive state recapitalization of the banking system. Um, and uh, ERI, uh, we believe, has some instructive applications, uh, not just for the Italian case, uh, but for the case of uh, European economies uh, as a whole. And so uh, the, uh, the, the question that we leave you with is the thought that uh, crises in general are a useful learning experience. Um, we need crises in order to get institutional change in order to get institutional reform. Um, and so it seems an appropriate note to leave you with uh, whether this crisis is also going to be the basis for a new kind of institutional reform and new innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Stefano Fenolte will be the first discussion. Let me begin by thanking the Bank of Italy for this gargantuan feast for all of us interested in Italy's past development. I'm to comment on uh, the paper you've just heard. I would be inclined to praise it, but uh, I think my brief is a different one. I'm here to quibble, to complain, excuse, to carp. Uh, to carp uh, means to bring out the fishy elements of the story. Uh, my general 
point um, is uh, simply to point out to the authors that despite their protestations that they are not involving themselves in any disputes, uh, in fact they are, uh, very much so. Uh, inevitably so, perhaps. Uh, it's a bit like writing uh, of mid-19th century developments in the United States. And if you call the nasty bit the war between the states, you're making a statement. And if you call it the Civil War, you're making a statement. But you've got to call it something. Uh, my more sp specific points are uh, Three, the first, to nobody's surprise, concerns tariff policy. Uh, your argument, as I read it and as I hear it, is that there's no particular specificity uh, to the Italian case. Um, again, I quibble. Um, it's like saying, you know, it was raining, Italy went out without an umbrella, but nobody had an umbrella. But the relevant specificity is that everybody else had a raincoat. Um, to get out of this metaphor, uh, you mentioned Terni. You say, you know, everybody else did the same thing. Everybody else protected a domestic uh, armaments industry. The operative difference is that everybody else got an independent armaments industry. Italy did not, for the good and simple reason that Italy lacked coal. We would always remain dependent on an ally that controlled the seas. Otherwise, in the absence of such an ally, as in the Second World War, our defense industry could not produce at all. So the specificity may not be where you're looking for it, but it may be there nonetheless. Uh, let me come to the broader question of protection in general. You've alluded to our discussions and disagreements. Let me wade uh, directly into that. Uh, just to start with a methodological observation, uh, you say of one author that his evaluations are obviously suspects, those are your words, as they are only as reliable as the framework used to generate them. Well, I, I, I submit this as the academic equivalent of a doomsday machine where the nuclear hand grenade I once hoped to patent, you certainly wipe out your target. You wipe out me as part of the collateral damage. But I'm not sure there will be much left of you at the end. Surely this applies to all of us. And here, um, Let's get to the issue of the tariff. Your analysis is in terms of a comparative advantage model. And uh, resources are given. Full employment is given. The only thing we can have here is misallocation. So basically, we're reducing the possible solutions to the problem, two Harberger triangles, which, as we know, don't, uh, don't amount to much. They can't. Uh, so if you look at the graph that's on the screen, uh, this is a very Ricardian model, the real wages in grain. Uh, the line that dope slopes downward from the left is the marginal product in grain in agriculture. Uh, the line that goes, that slopes down the other way, is the marginal product in the other sector, call it manufacturing, converted to grain. We multiply by the price of manufacturers divided by the price of grain. M and G should be subscripts. They came out large. If you raise the grain tariff, uh, the denominator there arises, so the whole line shifts down, right? Every bolt of cloth in manufacturing is now worth less grain. In the context of the comparative advantage model, 
you reach the new equilibrium uh, where the lower curve that slopes downward from the right and the curve that slopes downward from the left intersect. Resources cannot fall, the real wage must fall. But we have another Ricardian model in which it's the real wage that cannot be compressed. And it cannot be compressed uh, in Ricardo because it's subsistence. Uh, I think it's more usefully interpreted as a reservation migration wage. But if the wage cannot be compressed, then the new equilibrium involves a leftward movement of the right-hand corner of this diagram. Resources are lost. Resources are lost. The right-hand margin of this diagram moves left, taking the curve up with it until the new intersection is back at the old real wage. Interestingly, with this extreme assumption of a grain real wage, nothing happens in agriculture. The only effect of the grain tariff is to uh, reduce the manufacturing sector. Uh, so in a sense, instead of moving along the production possibilities curve, the production possibilities curve moves inward. Coming back to the growth model, uh, the left-hand part of this, uh, just ignore the right-hand part, is a standard growth model, Ricardo. You have L1 agricultural laborers producing their own subsistence G1, uh, a surplus G2 minus G1. Uh, that surplus uh, is the rent, which at the prevailing wage uh, real wage uh, supports L2 minus L1 workers who are not in agriculture. Uh, all I'm doing here is making a box diagram out of this. Uh, I duplicate this first one and simply rotate it around the center of my graph, the point G2 L2. Now, what I find interesting about this graph is that it brings home in a very simple way the basic policy choices. If uh, these two countries now, they're identical as far as agricultural endowment real wage is concerned. Uh, if they are both, uh, if they're not trading or trading manufacturers for manufacturers, they're both in L2, uh, the equilibrium is L2 G2. But what you can see here is a core periphery story. Imagine that the country, uh, our bottom right, excuse me, our bottom left country, uh, is like say Eastern Europe uh, in, the, in the modern period. They collect, their landowners collect a rent and they export it as such. They're the periphery. The core country is the other one. Employment in the core is everything L4 except for L1. Russia's manufacturing sector is in the Netherlands and in England. Now with this model, uh, I think you can see various things. For instance, it's much more useful than the comparative advantage model on the benefits for the U.S. Uh, from the industrial tariff. It's not exploiting monopoly power in cotton. It's moving from periphery to autarky. The U.S. imports L2 minus L1 workers. Now in this context, the question is, what should Italy have done? Italy has lots of people, little land. Autarchy in Italy is poverty. Italy's only hope was to adopt, if you will, the, the Cipolla solution that uh, the governor of the bank quoted uh, at the opening of the Congress. Italy's only hope was to become core. England chose to become core. Uh, 
France and Germany uh, had much lower population densities um, and were historically uh, in ancient through the Middle Ages and modern times uh, were actually grain exporters you know, until the Great Plains came in. So the question again becomes, who do you want to compare yourself to? And my sense is that the more appropriate comparison for Italy is equally land poor England. England chose to give up the Corn Laws, became the workshop of the world. Italy chose to impose the Corn Laws, gave up any hope of becoming a workshop, and pushed out uh, a large number of its workers. Uh, the next issue uh, concerns uh, capital scarcity, the story you tell there. Uh, this is uh, a graph of the trade deficit, uh, which up to a trend correction from uh, remittances is the capital cycle. Uh, and except for the very early part, it's parallel to British capital exports. Uh, now here, you refer to policy measures uh, at various times that spark uh, waves of capital imports. Uh, these statistics, they're from Michael Edelstein's uh, unpublished appendix way back when. Uh, these are uh, interest rate premia. Uh, taken at except for column five, ignore it for now. These are basically Kuznet cycle turning points. Uh, what we see is that uh, we have a flat uh, series for British private bonds. This is what uh, justifies the uh, Habakkuk-Lewis critique in my eyes. Uh, in the middle group, you see a violent cycle in the premium. In the bottom line, you see the Italian uh, consul premium. And the Italian story is the story of American railways. So unless uh, you find, to my mind, some equivalent uh, whereby the Guatemalan railways also uh, took policy decisions that encouraged capital imports, uh, my sense is that what we're seeing is, uh, as Habakkuk and Lewis argued, uh, a wave in confidence and lack of confidence in foreign bonds, and Italy, to a first approximation, simply was part of the periphery. I see no distinctive effect of Italian policy. Uh, not even Adwa mattered much. Uh, and this brings me to the interpretation of this. Uh, you notice that at the very end, the premium drops. If you go back here, you notice at the very beginning, Italy is importing capital when England is not exporting capital uh, in a big way. My interpretation is that capital markets work the way alumni giving works in the United States. If the basketball team wins, you get more money. Uh, here, my sense is that the successful uh, the success of unification uh, brought in its wake high expectations for United Italy. In 1866, it's not just that we lost, it's how we lost. Uh, we proclaimed ourselves as a bunch of buffoons. Uh, Adwa does not seem to have been used. We, were, we performed true to expectations. And again, we remain an ordinary member of, member of the periphery past 1906. Only in 1913 are we different. And I think it's because we finally won a war against Turkey. Uh, I don't see any logic to it. No, it's as if I, my banker would said to me, OK, uh, we will give you a mortgage if you can document that you beat your wife. Uh, I don't see the logic to it, but I think I see the psychology of it. And uh, that is what the evidence seems to say. Uh, there was a third point. 
it will remain forever secret. My time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, you will have perhaps the chance to, uh, to refer to your third point in the general discussion. Uh, Vera Zamani is the second discussant. Thank you very much. I have liked this paper because it is qu quite a well-balanced paper. And um, I will tackle three or four points uh, very briefly. The first, there's been um, a starting of the, of the paper on the point of capital scarcity. Uh, let me dwell a minute on the scarcity. I think it was based uh, on three aspects. The first, very well known, is resources, particularly coal, we all know. If we have to believe Bob Allen's latest book on the British Industrial Revolution, um, two had been the, the key factors for this British Industrial Revolution, high real wages uh, before the Industrial Revolution, which pushed uh, towards uh, substitution of machinery to labor, and coal, because of steam engine, energy, uh, paddling of iron, and so on. Nothing of this existed in Italy, and so certainly this was a, a point uh, of disadvantage. But they, it's not the only one, you know, because the second was land, poor land, at the exception of the Po Valley. Uh, and therefore, mm, not large capability of this land to be improved. And number three, commerce. Uh, uh, Italy had lost uh, markets. And here is my long-run disagreement with Giovanni Federico on the role of silk, because silk had the basic role, precisely that of uh, granting Italy the only real uh, uh, thing that could be uh, traded at the beginning of uh, unification, so that Italy had to resort to all sorts of things, uh, tourism, emigrant remittances, you know, to make up the possibility of... of uh, trading or, or exchanging with uh, the rest of the world. So, capital scarce country for under, uh, a number of reasons. In the face of such disadvantages, uh, the surprise uh, was cer certainly free trade and not protection. Do I need to remind everybody that all large countries industrialized with protectionism? This was the old uh, Baroquian message, modelized some years ago by Jeff uh, Williamson. I have, in general, been quite happy of the way the tariff issue has been dealt with by the authors, but just a few remarks. Agriculture. Do I need to remind that the British industrialized with the corn laws? Now, the Ricardia argument uh, um, uh, reminded by Stefano Finaltea is very well known, also because uh, he repeats it several times. Um, and um, the problem is this. If Italy had been alone in doing uh, an, uh, an agricultural protection, that maybe it would be a problem. But actually, everybody was doing agricultural protection at the time. And by all means, up until the 1970s, up until today, so, indeed, there are the disadvantages uh, that the Ricardian model show, but... And in, in the case of Italy, uh, perhaps the interesting argument uh, to raise is whether it was a good idea to uh, protect uh, so much wheat and sugar rather than something else. Uh, sugar, it was... A a loss over the long run, because in the end we had to discard the sugar industry. You know? But it took 150 years before this was the case. Uh, 130 years. You know? And wheat was still in the field of wheat protection. You know? And certainly the exodus that was taking place from uh, southern Italy uh, suggested that, that wheat was the right target, uh, but perhaps over the long run, not, not so right. And sugar, certainly, um, precisely because uh, wheat uh, was uh, not so enticing, you know, uh, the idea for the northern uh, farmers was to diversify, and the sugar beet was the, the obvious uh, product. 
And the second comment uh, still on this uh, topic of protection uh, has to do with uh, steel and textiles. The two um, uh, industries became quite established in Italy. Textiles even too much. No? Um, if uh, we have to believe the model put forward by Rurke and Federico, if we did not protect steel, the result would have been to have even more textiles maybe not the best of possible solutions. Uh, steel, no? in the end we did everything to have steel. No? All sorts of things we did to have steel, to uh, state support, uh, bailing out operations, repeated bailing out operations, repeated bailing out operations, and in the end uh, state-owned enterprises and uh, funds from the Marshall Plan and all this. Are we really sure that Italy could have a large engineering industry without steel? Question mark. I don't think ever nobody has asked this. And in any case, steel has become an important part of uh, industry in Italy. Um, Italy has become the second produ largest producer of steel in Western Europe after Germany. No? Something unbelievable <laughs> if you look at how this was achieved. Okay, this much for uh, the first uh, part. Then um, on your second section, I only have a couple of uh, suggestions. Uh, Italian public debt was not mostly sold abroad. Um, I've tried uh, to give an estimate of how much was put abroad, so maybe you better have a look to. I know I have written in Italian this piece, pity. Uh, but. Um, in uh, the balance of payments, as it has been said by, by, by also Stefano, no, you have to take into account immigrant remittances before the First World War to make sense of, uh, of uh, the balance of payment itself. But my last comment, uh, I want to concentrate on uh, banking reform and universal banks uh, and ERI. I'm afraid that the coverage of the literature on universal bank uh, is not precisely uh, adequate. No. There is enough written in English also, more obviously written in Italian on this. Um, you have taken rather the, the negative view on universal banks that exist in uh, the Italian literature, uh, but is not the only one that, that exists. Um, you come to the point of writing that they supported quite speculative enterprises. Actually, they supported all the modern enterprises uh, of the time, uh, from electricity to steel to chemicals uh, and uh, engineering. All were supported by these. Uh, to call them speculative seems a bit excessive, in fact. Um, uh, and they were the ones that supported hydroelectricity, not the state that came later, only in the First World War, but it was, uh, hydroelectricity was quite well established uh, much before then. And then you say that these uh, universal banks were um, uh, not uh, solid. Indeed, this is the view particularly from Bank of Italy uh, quarters of the time, that the, the universal banks were not uh, solid. But we have to discount the fact that the First World War dislocated the entire uh, uh, nation, the entire society, not only the economy of Italy, uh, is a very good example of the differential of contemporaneousness uh, of Pollard, you know, uh, a country that had to fight the war or wanted to fight the war totally unprepared, uh, and there was an entire dislocation of the system at the economic, uh, so, uh, social, and political uh, you know, aspects. Uh, no? And indeed, also the universal banks had obviously uh, major uh, drawbacks. In any case, uh, there are um, difficulties at the time of the 1929 crisis was the same as that existing in Germany or uh, in Austria. Uh, in Austria, as you know, they let uh, the Credit Anstalt fail and then uh, they reconstituted it uh, in uh, Germany. And to be comparative on this issue, I think it's, it's extremely important. Uh, in Germany, they rescued the universal banks, which were not in a better shape than the Italian universal banks, uh, no, but they left them as they were, you know, in place. And instead, in Italy, they decided uh, 
uh, to put in place Siri because there was Mussolini, state, uh, uh, of course, method match, but the result of this has been uh, that over time, Italy has changed uh, uh, the banking system four times. <laughs> no other country, I think, in the world has had this experience. At first, Italy had uh, uh, a more or less a specialized banking system, uh, the French, then universal banks, uh, and then uh, state-owned uh, banks, uh, particularly uh, the Instituti di Credito Speciale, the sort of investment banks uh, state-owned, uh, and, and no longer universal banks, and then uh, the 1990-1993 reform, uh, no, which is... So, um, uh, uh, I think that the Erie case must be put in this context, and it was not so much that the universal banks were vulnerable, perhaps uh, reasons for this change and this reform were different from that. And the results, as I said, I mean, it might have been really an, an overdoing of the reforms, you know, too many, you know, to change systems so frequently is probably not the best uh, um, way of uh, uh, helping the system to grow steadily. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veda. We have five minutes left for uh, replies on your part to the discussions, if you, if you wish so. Uh, well, I, I, I will uh, uh, have a general discussion from the audience at the end of the two presentations. Okay, very, very quickly then. Thanks to both of the discussants for their very fair and thought-provoking comments. Actually, there's a lot of food for thought there. Um, the uh, work that we regarded as obviously suspect was work that showed that Italy was very highly protectionist in an international context in the late 19th century, and this was based on work of a friend of ours that measures protection by saying, I have an econometric model that predicts the level of trade that I should observe in a country if Hexerolan theory is correct. And then I compare the predictions of that model with reality. And if reality doesn't fit the model, then it must obviously be because you're a protectionist. And I can see some problems with that. Um, on on, on, on the, the point about Harburger triangles always being small, I mean, yes, you're absolutely right. and. Uh, you're absolutely right, and this is why I've given up using CGE models to say anything about welfare, because the, the interesting welfare effects are all dynamic, and we don't have a generally agreed upon dynamic uh, model of growth that, that, that we can discuss. Of course, um, if you move beyond the classic CGE framework, which we use a little bit in this paper just to try to get a sense of what the impact effect of the tariffs were on the sizes of different sectors. Um, if you move beyond that framework, then once you introduce non-convexities, they can, they can work in many different ways. It depends on, on how you do it. I, I like your Ricardian story, I have to say, and well, Charlie Kindleberger talked a long time ago about how essentially you made the choice for emigration when faced with the grain invasion, and there is a lot to be said for that. Uh, I, mean, on the, I, I guess I do have to note, as an Irish person, that uh, in the UK, there was a bit of the UK that also saw a lot of emigration, despite the fact that, that we were part of that. Um, <coughs> polity. Uh, and I think your points about coal are very well taken too. And I think that the point about coal and the military industrial complex is, is pregnant with tragic significance because Italy and several other countries realized in the 20th century that in order to be truly secure, they can't rely on the market necessarily. And th this leads to the search for imperial autarky. And this is part of when, what went wrong in the early 20th century. And it's the genius of the the, the, the architects of the post-war, post-Second War, post -second war uh, international system that we seem to have gotten away from that uh, logic. And finally, on the capital cycles, yeah, I like. I mean, again, I, I basically buy your story about the the, 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 the cycles being driven by international uh, forces. I don't think that there is necessarily a contradiction between saying, on the one hand, the amount of capital that you actually manage to attract at a given moment in time is largely driven by British savings behavior or whatever it might be on the one hand, and on the other hand saying that particular countries try to put in place policies to make them as attractive a destination for these capital flows when they become available. 
So I don't think that, but I, I agree we need to think a little bit more about the timing and so on. So that's, that's where I leave it. I, I, I just wanted to pick up on the last point as well. I, I, I was really intrigued by this application of the idea that um, the London capital markets behave like alumni in American universities. Um, I, 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 I thought it was very intriguing, uh, the story of looking at military events and comparing 1866 and 1913. But then on the other hand, you know, it struck me uh, one of the things that I thought it would be interesting to do with this comparison of uh, Italian bond yields um, versus French bond yields was to compare it with Switzerland, which is actually quite a similar story uh, up, to, up to the early 20th century. Uh, but in the early 20th century, the differential disappears with the Swiss case. But I'm not aware that Switzerland uh, won any big military conflict in the, in the, in the early, early 20th century. So it does seem to me that there's something else as well that, that, that goes on there uh, and that uh, uh, you know, there, are, there are real indications of uh, how, uh, how economies are converging and uh, how... Uh, fiscal and uh, also the trade performance uh, works. I mean, it seems to me also that that's, that's an important point to make um, with regard to uh, the, the point that Professor Samanyi had um, about the steel industry and its relationship to the engineering industry because um, the, the same kind of point about uh, the the, the need for steel for the development of a big uh, engineering and uh, other metal products industry uh, could, I think, be made about Switzerland. And in some ways, there are some quite good comparisons to be made there. But uh, Switzerland, with the same kind of resource problems, it doesn't go on the complete route of, uh, of, of going for Tani. Um, and, and, and then the, uh, the, the other uh, question that I wanted to, to address a bit was the, the banking question. Um, I think it would be true to say that universal banks have a very vulnerable business model uh, in times of uh, rapid either inflation or deflation. They're, they're, the, the effects of uh, monetary change on their balance sheet is really profoundly disturbing. And so uh, I absolutely agree with the point that the Italian banks are no different to the Austrian or the Hungarian or the German banks or other banks in Central Europe. But it does seem to me that, that the Italian solution is really quite a unique one there. And uh, that was really the point that we wanted to make. I mean, in, in some ways, this, this comes out sometimes in, in, a, in, a, in a positive story. I mean, that's the pro story that Professor Toniolo uh, uh, tells, uh, that in Germany and in Austria and in Hungary, there were bank panics, and there was a, really a dramatic crisis in 1931. And Italy, with the same kind of banking situation, um, had fundamentally insolvent banks, but without the bank run. Uh, and th th this, uh, then the, the kind of Italian answer to that uh, was a bit of institutional innovation. Um, did other countries have absolutely constant banking systems? Well, you know, again, it depends uh, really what you mean, because the German banks were also nationalized and then reprivatized in the 1930s. Um, it, it was just uh, actually a policy difference that is analogous to contemporary debates with uh, insolvent banks. Do you take them over uh, or do you take out the bad assets and split them off? Um, the, 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 that actually is, is, is something that has really very interesting uh, comparative uh, and contemporary uh, policy lessons. And thanks. Good. Uh, thank you very much to all participants to, uh, to this first discussion. We can now move to the second paper, the Golden Age and the Second Globalization in Italy. And so I ask uh, Nicholas Crafts, Marco Magnani, Alberto Resina, and Pierluigi Ciocca to join me at, uh, at the table.